Good afternoon. The seminar is about to begin. We welcome you to Webinar 4, Value-Based Insurance Design, with Mark Vendrick and Mark Gagne, presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation. We hope you enjoy the program, and we thank you for joining us today. A PDF copy of today's presentation, along with materials provided by your speaker, have been made available to you to print or download. You may access these documents by clicking the Resource tab on the left side of your screen. You're encouraged to submit questions at any time throughout the broadcast by selecting the Forum tab on the left side of your screen. Simply type your email address in your question and click Send Question. Mr. Fendrick will answer questions at the end of the program, and questions not addressed within our available time may be answered by way of a post-conference email. At this time, I'm happy to, to introduce Janet Troutwine, NAHU's Executive Vice President and CEO, and NAHU's Education Foundation President. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I do want to welcome all of you to today's webinar. We have a large number of people attending today. This webinar is a part, uh, to remind you, of a 10-part series that runs through November. And today's webinar, as well as all future webinars, are free, and they're located on the NAHU Education Foundation's website, which is nahuef.org. As Jennifer said, today's webinar is the fourth in our series, and it's entitled Value-Based Insurance Design. I do encourage all of you to view all of the webinars in the 10-part series and to give us your feedback. It's my pleasure now to introduce the presenters for today's session, and I believe that you can see their images on the screen in front of you. Dr. Mark Fendrick is a professor of internal medicine in the School of Medicine and a Professor of Health Management and Policy in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. He received a bachelor's degree in economics and chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a fellow in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program. Dr. Fendrick conceptualized and coined the term value-based insurance design, which you might have heard called VBID, and he currently directs the VBID Center at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on how clinician payment and consumer engagement can impact access to care and quality of care as well as health care costs. Dr. Fendrick is well known and has authored over 250 articles and book chapters and has received numerous awards for the creation and implementation of value-based insurance design. He's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, serves on the Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee, and has been invited to present testimony before the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and the U.S. House of Representatives Ways and Means Subcommittee on Health. And I would point out to you on the slide in front of you You'll see his contact information, and uh, at the bottom is his hashtag, and he has a very active uh, Twitter feed going on, and I encourage you to communicate with them at the VBID Center uh, in either one of those mediums that is convenient for you. Mark Gagne is a, our co-presenter today. Mark is a co-owner and chief innovation officer of Boris Lowe Insurance. Located in the greater Boston area, Boris Lowe Insurance is highly regarded as a leading employee benefits brokerage and consulting firm, serving over 350 corporate and 2,000 individual clients and more than 100,000 members in 35 states across the country. Mark has more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry, and he's a pioneer in the use of consumer-driven wellness plans, which, as we know, lower healthcare costs and improve health and well-being. Mark is passionate about the power of consumerism, health, and wellness to transform workplace culture. He's a member of the Board of Directors for the Massachusetts Health Connector and the National Association of Health Underwriters Chair of the Healthcare Cost and Quality Transparency Committee. He's a certified PPACA and self-funding expert by NAHU, and his unique ability is developing innovative solutions to complex challenges. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters today. Thank you, Janet. Appreciate the warm introduction. And Mark, on behalf of the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation, it's a pleasure to uh, speak with you today. 
when we take a look at our conversation this afternoon, we're going to be speaking about a subject that's near and dear to all of our all of our hearts and, frankly, all the hearts and minds of the people that we serve every single day. Let's rewind the tape back to 2002 and 2004 for the birth of the American Consumer Driven Health Plan. Why are those dates important in 2002? The health reimbursement arrangement came into being in 2004. The health savings account came into, into being through the tax law uh, through the IRS. For those that may not be aware, a Consumer Driven Health Plan is a combination of a lower premium high deductible health plan paired with a health savings account or a health reimbursement arrangement or both. IRS regulations require that HSA owners purchase a qualified high deductible health plan where all, where all services, with the exception of preventive care, are subject to those, uh, to, to those deductibles. The minimum deductibles in 2015 are $1,300 for a single and $2,600 for a family. What was the impact of this regulatory design on a consumer by requiring consumers to purchase a qualified high deductible health plan in order to have a health savings account? Were there any unintended consequences by virtue of that mechanical uh, design? With over a decade of experience now in consumer-driven health and wellness plans and health savings accounts, what have we learned over the past 10, 11 years? What works? What doesn't work? What would we change if we could go back and adjust the regulation or the legislation that helps us promulgate the regulation. For the next 90 minutes, Mark and I will walk you through the next evolution of consumer-driven health plans and introduce you to some innovative thinking on the matter and focus our energy and effort on value-based insurance design, a subject that Mark is an expert in. So with that, I'll turn the reins over to Mark, and he and I will, like we have done with other webinars, go back and forth throughout the day. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for the warm welcome. And, and thank you all taking time out of your busy days to learn a little bit about value-based insurance design. It is um, a great opportunity to talk to uh, this organization, understanding the key role that you play as stakeholders in healthcare transformation in this country. And uh, as Janet said, you please reach out to us uh, via the email address and the Twitter hashtag mentioned on the slide or just Google VBID like my mother does. We uh, passed vehicular born incendiary device in 1999, and it'll take you to the VBID Center website where there'll be lots of resources, many of which will be touched upon briefly uh, during the webinar today. So I'll just start out with uh, taking a few steps back to the issue of uh, consumer directed health plan and just give you some views that have kind of led uh, myself and my colleague Michael Chernu. Uh, Mark's colleague on the Massachusetts Connector, now at Harvard Medical School, in, in terms of how we got to where we are. So, of course, uh, as a practicing clinician, I'll tell you that um, the reason why I went to medical school was to not deal with cost of care, but in fact to prevent disease and to treat disease to hopefully reduce morbidity and mortality among individuals and populations. But uh, as I travel as an academic and now more of a policy person, it is uh, universal in the fact that no matter where I go, <clears throat> everyone wants to talk about how much we're spending on healthcare and how we might bend the trend. And I tend to tell people that my dedicated colleagues in clinical medicine, pharmacy, uh, physical therapy, any number of, of clinical areas, uh, we did not go to medical school to learn how to save people money. Uh, we in fact went to medical school, pharmacy school, PT school, et cetera, to learn how to make individuals and populations better. So in all this discussion of pressure to do less, to do less, to do less, it's important for me to point out to you that if I would ask all of you on the phone to tell me what should we be spending our healthcare dollars on, I would tell you that each and every one of those things, whether it be preventive screenings or immunizations, uh, physician clinician visits or management of chronic diseases, you will see that in these high value services, there is substantial systematic underutilization of these things across the entire spectrum of care. So if there was one key message I would ask each of you to take away uh, from the hour or so you're gonna spend with Mark and myself is that we should change the conversation from how much we spend on healthcare to how well we spend our healthcare dollars. And I really do believe that NAHU members can help facilitate this discussion from how much to how well. So 
you'll see on this next slide that while a lot of the information presented in the nine other webinars is going to be on prices and costs in the aggregate, uh, today we're going to talk about costs paid by the consumer. So the out-of-pocket costs of your uh, clients and your colleagues in terms of premiums, uh, cost sharing in terms of co-payments, co-insurance, and deductibles. And uh, to be talking to NAHU members, I, I'm, I believe I'm a bit out of step by reminding us that um, cost sharing levels, if you go back to the textbooks, uh, should be set to encourage the clinical appropriate use of healthcare services. Thus, my patient with two sisters and a mother with breast cancer should not face a high cost sharing to get her mammogram. My patient with diabetes, uh, very difficult to control, her blood sugar should not have financial toxicity when it comes to filling her insulin. And I want to make very clear from the get-go that I am all for consumer responsibility, uh, patient accountability, and high levels of cost sharing. I just feel very strongly that cost sharing should be implemented on those services that a clinician and their patient should think twice or thrice about ordering instead of the current model where uh, these financial levers are put in in what we call a one-size-fits-all way. What I mean by that is most of your clients and customers <clears throat> buy health plans that require their consumers to pay the same out-of-pocket for every doctor visit, every diagnostic test, and every prescription drug within the tier of the formulary. So it costs me to send my patients to whether it be primary care physicians in or out of network. They pay the same to see a cardiologist after a heart attack or for a dermatologist for mild acne I could barely see same price in network. And I think most of you admit that there probably are clinical differences between those two visits. The same holds through for diagnostic tests. And it's certainly easier for me to explain this in the terms of prescription drugs and the fact that within the tier of the formulary, people tend to pay the same out-of-pocket for life-saving drugs for cancer, diabetes, mental health, heart disease, as they do for drugs that make their toenail fungus go away or their hair grow back. So we pay the same $25 copayment for a branded statin to lower your cholesterol as you would for a branded proton pump inhibitor to deal with your heartburn. And I will tell you that not only do I feel that this kind of one-size-fits-all cost-sharing may not fully implement uh, the precision medicine that the clinical side is actually moving to, as most of you know, and certainly, uh, Janet, I applaud you for timing this webinar as it is, there has been significant press around uh, consumer cost sharing. Uh, reports from Kaiser Family Foundation, Families USA, and the Commonwealth Fund all in the last 10 days have uh, drawn attention to the fact that individuals are being asked to pay more and more out of pocket uh, for their health care services regardless of their clinical benefit. So Dr. Turner at Harvard and myself uh, as academics embarked on an, an academic agenda I like to say in the last century, uh, to take a look at what might be the consumer response to these one size fits all cost share. So you, it shouldn't surprise you that as we and many others have looked at the impact of rising prices for the American consumer for both high and low value services, as the price to the consumer goes up, individuals reduce the use of both high and low value. And this increase in cost sharing is shown to not only lead to worse health, it reduces health care disparities, and actually counterintuitively, sometimes increasing cost sharing on the consumer for certain services actually leads to higher aggregate costs. So as you see from this New York Times piece, uh, we've, we've stepped out of the academic realm into now uh, the lay media area. And I should tell you, as I uh, talk to NAHU members, that when I first started this agenda well over a decade ago, I turned to a non-healthcare expert, but one of the great uh, inspirations in my life, my mother, who said, I can't believe you had to spend a million dollars to show that if you make people pay more for something, they'll buy less of it. And I believe that, again, people should spend a lot of money on healthcare for the things that don't make them healthier. But for the things that we deem to be high quality metrics, it always perplexed Dr. Cherno and I why we actually saw this evolution of a one-size-fits-all cost-sharing increases. 
And if you don't believe me, you have to believe you and your mother that they're always right. And here are just some studies quickly to show that when Medicare beneficiaries uh, who are females who are going undergoing mammography, when they're asked to pay more, uh, they use less mammography. Uh, this study by Dana Goldman and others shows that when people are asked to pay more for drugs for diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, asthma, depression, uh, they buy significantly less. And I think that it's come to fore that although we had some great progress regarding cost-related non-adherence in our Medicare population, it's been very interesting that after the initial significant strides forward we saw with the implementation of Part D, uh, this health of air study on this slide shows clearly that cost-related non-adherence has increased substantially in the past few years, and particularly uh, the prevalence among the sickest elderly for admitting to foregoing needs uh, to purchase medicines decreased initially with Part D, but then rose now to higher levels than even before Part D in 2011. And most projections suggest that cost-related non-adherence is going up quite dramatically in the Medicare population. So we have been following this issue of cost-related non-adherence very carefully. Uh, again, many of these studies are available for your access on our website. Uh, this is a report that was published within the month uh, from California, just looking at people and their response to being delayed care due to cost. And these are folks with insurance. And you can see from this slide that 40% of respondents in California basically responded to the fact that they delayed the use of healthcare services because of cost. So our concern and issue of cost-related non-adherence 15 years ago, which was a sideline problem, is starting to become a substantial minority problem. And if you look at uh, the recent Commonwealth report from last week reporting that 31% of Americans uh, approaching over 30 million are now reporting to be underinsured in the fact that even though they have coverage, they have cost-related problems, uh, certainly requires a better attention, in our opinion, to the role of cost-sharing and how it may play out in the health of covered individuals. I want to just say quickly, since uh, Janet and uh, the NAHU staff are in Washington, that um, I'm very happy to say that cost-related non-adherence is a bipartisan problem, that we, when we cut one study who actually provided their party affiliation, we see that the same number of people who are Democrats and Republicans say cost is one reason they have not utilized uh, preventive care. So you can imagine when I turn uh, to my two mother quick, and I two say- quick comments here. I think one of the, two of the oh, things sure. we could uh, say about our, about our audience here at NEHU is we all understand that health insurance is expensive because health care is expensive. And unfortunately, transparency, uh, as we've seen through uh, um, through studies across the country is not very prevalent, which makes acting as an informed consumer a very difficult challenge. I also would suggest that our membership is very passionate about making sure that the people they represent are getting the right care in the right place at the right time by the right provider. And so I, I know you're going to continue to address that type of thinking. I'm just setting the stage for you in terms of how the audience might be perceiving uh, this type of conversation. No, and I, I appreciate that, Mark, and I would add to the, the right service, to the right person, by the right provider, at the right location, at the right price, is uh, something we're very much aligned on. And I think Absolutely. that that is uh, kind of helped uh, the movement of, of what we're doing moving forward, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. But you can imagine that as the growth of, of consumer cost sharing has grown in, in all populations, um, we were particularly concerned from an academic perspective that those who were socioeconomically challenged and, and the people I personally care for in my practice with multiple chronic diseases uh, might be even more prone uh, to the negative clinical implications of cost-related non-adherence. So you could imagine when I turned to that great inspiration, my mother, and said I had to raise a half million dollars to show that poor people were impacted by high prices more than rich people, but we were lucky enough to get that funding and we're able to publish this paper showing that um, rising co-payments actually worsen socioeconomic and healthcare disparities, something I care very dear about, and adversely affect health, uh, particularly among economically vulnerable individuals and those with common chronic conditions, thus kind of adding some increased interest in some potential uh, solutions moving forward. But I think that 
I want to use one more example before I talk about that solution and, and certainly look forward to your opinion on this, Mark, is that um, we saw this trend moving toward cost sharing. As I said, and I'll probably say four times, I, I am a big fan of, of consumer responsibility and putting the financial onus on consumers when it's deemed clinically appropriate. But uh, this study, which I think was very interesting, uh, looking at a, a natural experiment that occurred in Medicare where Medicare Advantage beneficiaries were asked to pay $7 more to see their primary care providers and $10 more to see their specialists. And as all our mothers would have predicted, the people who were asked to pay more to see their doctor for the reasons, Mark, that you alluded to, they went less often. In fact, they went 20 fewer times uh, per year for 100 Medicare Advantage enrollees. It turned out, unfortunately, although somewhat predictably, that there were two incremental hospitalizations per 100 employees. And uh, lo and behold, the famous adage of penny wise, pound foolish was brought to bear in the fact that all the savings of those 20 fewer outpatient visits were completely gobbled up and more uh, by those additional inpatient visits, thus uh, bringing real attention uh, to this issue of how much to how well. And I show this slide uh, not from the New England Journal of Medicine, but from the Wall Street Journal of Medicine that shows that we published and we didn't perish. In fact, that um, the work that we were doing to show that non-nuanced cost sharing might lead to not only a less healthy workforce, but maybe more importantly, a lower stock price, started to gain attention from many of America's largest employers, uh, in this case, IBM, started to think a little differently about their benefits and said, you know, maybe we should implement cost sharing more in a nuanced way as opposed to the traditional one size fits all, make people pay more for everything until they reach a level of deductible. And uh, this has been quite encouraging to see how rapidly uh, various stakeholders across all ideologies and all political realities have started to see the light regarding uh, potential solutions to the cost related not adherence problem. So here we are. Um, it, it obviously was somewhat um, rewarding, but a lack of feeling somewhat ineffectual to show that the non-nuanced increases in cost sharing were not giving us the efficiency, not giving us the healthcare gains, not giving us the productivity gains, not giving us the high-performing healthcare system we were looking for. And then uh, Dr. Chernu and I were challenged now, uh, well over a decade, to come up with a potential solution. And I think this is a slide that I would love, uh, Janet, to recommend all of your members to linger on long after you get rid of me, which is this uh, new approach that we call clinical nuance. And I strongly believe that NAHU members uh, will, will think this through and uh, realize that there's great opportunities to improve upon what we have when we think about this somewhat straightforward infographic. The first part about clinical nuance is just acknowledging what I believe is the somewhat straightforward fact that clinical services differ in the benefit that are produced for patients and populations. That some drugs within the tier of the formulary are more valuable than others. That some diagnostic tests are more valuable than others. And that some clinician visits are more valuable than others. And uh, as I told Mark in the pre-call, that I, you know, I've traveled to 49 states talking about clinical nuance, and if there's anyone from North Dakota who would like me to invite me out to uh, check off my 50th state, I'm happy to see your email at the VBID Center email address. But I, I've not had anyone come up to me and say, I really do believe that all drugs, all diagnostic tests, and all doctor visits, clinician visits are the same, and thus that the current idea of, of charging uh, consumers the same price for these widely variable uh, in value services makes any sense. But for the NAHU audience, I think it's the second part of this slide to tack on to Mark's earlier comment, is that just deciding that a certain drug, a diagnostic test, or a visit is high or low value is not enough. And that the clinical benefits of a specific service depend on who receives it, who provides it, and where. And Mark, before I have you uh, chime in on your views on clinical nuance, I'm just going to give uh, an example that I think many people will quickly understand and be able to hopefully use it in explaining clinical nuance down the road. I've had a very, very long-standing interest in colorectal cancer screening 
a area that is strongly evidence-based for which there are very good research to show the potential life-saving benefits of screening uh, people to prevent colorectal cancer screening. However, if we take colonoscopy, for example, which many people would say is a high-value service, I will tell you that if you're a first-degree relative of a colon cancer sufferer, your plan should pay you to get screened. If you're 50 years old, you now can get colorectal cancer screening at no cost to the consumer. And if you're 28 years old and say you were motivated by Katie Couric's on-air colonoscopy, uh, many health plans allow access to that service, even though there is no clinical evidence uh, for doing it in that patient. And I believe that if you fall out of the recommended evidence-based guidelines, you should pay a substantial amount to get a test that's deemed to be unnecessary uh, by the evidence. So who receives it? Important aspect of clinical nuance. As Mark alluded to, who provides it matters. We want to pick high-performing providers. We want to identify those who do the procedure well and efficiently. Maybe they're chosen to be in a high-performing network for which cost-sharing might be uh, made different to uh, go to one provider who does higher quality than others. And last, and very important in the current national debate, is where services are provided. My current health plan allows me to get my colorectal cancer screening either in my hospital or an ambulatory care center where the same colonoscopist with the same colonoscopy can perform that same test on me on one-third of the cost. So the cornerstone of our solution is changing this dialogue from clinical services being homogeneous and the one-size-fits-all well to identifying and taking advantage of the whole precision medicine, targeted medicine movement that's happening on the provider side, but seriously lagging behind on the consumer engagement and benefit design side. And clinical nuance, in fact, is the cornerstone of our value-based insurance design initiatives. And with that, Mark, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for a bit. Yeah, no, I, th I thank you for, uh, and I actually, of all the slides we're going to talk about, I love this slide the most, and as you and I discussed, I think we all, we both agree that plan design, insurance plan design can play a key role in incentivizing a consumer to be more engaged and to help them lead a healthier lifestyle. And when I say a healthy lifestyle, it doesn't mean somebody doesn't have get any condition. If they, they're, they're a diabetic, they're hypertensive, they can treat those conditions and live a relatively you know, healthy lifestyle if they take care of them, uh, if they're accountable for the way in which they're making choices. We've seen through CDH, and I do agree with you, that by making a deductible cut across all services, it's discouraging some people uh, from taking advantage of the care that they should have to avoid these, you know, these challenging healthcare situations. I would say, on the whole, disease management uh, adherence has gone up as a result of consumerism. Uh, emer medical emergencies, in some cases, have, have people using the emergency room as their primary care physician have gone down. Uh, preventive care, depending on what study you read, will show improved levels of, of, of adherence or improved levels of, of utilization. And People who are covered on a CDH are more likely to engage with health pools, such as online programs, nurse advice lines, mail order prescription drugs, as drugs is an example. I think inherently we see with our customers that they want to make the right decision. With that being said, as you know, NEHU members, our job is to be advisors to our clients. Broker is a very short, uh, short word. Uh, it's really not representative of all the things that we do. Clients ask us to help them manage their risk, to help them improve the health and well-being of their employee population because at the end of the day, it's normally the largest investment uh, they are making it in their people. And to have people be healthy or make more informed purchasing choices is going to improve the overall health of the organization and, and lower costs. I think what we're hemmed in on and to some degree, and I know you're going to talk about this as we move forward, but to some degree we're hemmed in by current regulations. And I think what you're going to talk about will be very exciting is maybe we can modify that regulation so that we can actually help do the things that you're talking about without undoing the ability for people to move toward a health savings account as an example. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think you and I would agree a health savings account has a very important place uh, in the design of our insurance plan because it encourages people to pay attention to costs. But I agree with you, paying attention to costs in areas where they should but being protected in areas where they really shouldn't have to weigh cost versus getting that treatment. So said another way, I think if we could talk about, and I know this is what the heart of what you're talking about is, but if we could 
retain some of that risk on an individual basis, share some of that responsibility on an individual basis where it makes sense, and then protect people uh, where it makes sense. To us, that's more a more scientific or what you're calling nuanced approach to having people access the healthcare system. Right. So that's uh, extraordinarily well put. And it kind of the, the term of protection, I think, is a very important thing. So that, again, I, I, I want to strongly reiterate my strong support for consumer-directed health plans in terms of their lofty goals of personal accountability, price transparency, and lower cost. And I, I think that if we could take those three elements moving forward and, and add that important fourth element of protection to make sure that individuals can get the services that are clearly shown to be beneficial to them, uh, you know, we've hit the, the trifecta. And uh, with that, I think as a public health professor, you know, I'm a strong supporter of, of keeping healthy people healthy. But uh, I like to tell the unfortunate true story for me that when I got involved with this whole line of research 15 years ago, I thought actuaries were people who studied birds. And uh, <laughs> now I, I strongly realize with the support of the several national actuarial societies that um, while focusing on healthy people uh, may be important from a numbers and demographic standpoint, uh, but obviously is everyone on the phone knows um, Willie Sutton, who's the guy who dropped, robbed banks. That's where the money is. We all know that it's people with chronic conditions, uh, 5% of people generating 50% of spend, 15% generating 85% of spend, or in Medicare, 98% of spend. It's because of my colleagues in the actuarial sciences world that we have focused almost all of our efforts short of some public policy work that I'll allude to very briefly later on uh, those people who generate a substantial majority of the medical spend. So with that, the implementation of this idea of clinical nuance, which you know I really look forward to a discussion um, during the Q&A, is called value-based insurance design. And uh, you see here from this slide, we were very fortunate now over 10 years ago to be uh, written up in the Wall Street Journal. And as much as I think our academic publications helped us. It was this article that kind of put us in the national forefront. And I, I wish or don't wish this would be much more complicated, but what value-based insurance design basically does is sets consumer cost sharing on the clinical benefit, not the price of the service. So currently, cheap stuff is cheap to consumers, expensive stuff is expensive to consumers, and uh, the more you are willing to dive into the idea of clinical nuance or precision medicine, you might understand that there are some expensive therapies that I would pay my patients to take, and there are some low-cost interventions or generic drugs that I wouldn't give my dog. And as we continue to go into this blunt instrument of cost-sharing that's not nuanced, I think we don't get uh, those elements that uh, Mark Anya alluded to. And the good news, as opposed to the first time I interacted with Nehu staff when, you know, I was a crazy guy with a crazy idea. Uh, now uh, we could probably safely say that thousands of your clients and customers have implemented some form of clinical nuance benefit design, public and private, Republicans and Democrats, management and labor. And uh, we feel very fortunate that uh, with your help and many other stakeholders that the idea of VBID has allowed us to kind of move forward in the uh, national healthcare transformation discussion. So of course, um, you can imagine when I asked my mother to say I had to do some studies to see what would happen to utilization of services when I lowered their cost. And luckily my friends in Bentonville, Arkansas who work for Walmart were pretty confident that if we lowered costs on high value screenings, visits and prescription drugs that people would use them more often. And uh, we're very lucky now to have over 40 studies in the literature that uh, t show quite clearly that when you lower the cost to consumers for targeted uh, high-value services, in this case slides, this is prescription drugs, people will take them more often. But I don't want you to think under any circumstances will people take their drugs entirely as directed just because the costs are low. And many of you on the phone know that in some of your clients who have zero cost sharing for high-value drugs, adherence rates are still quite dismal. Uh, the bottom line is, is that depending on the size 
of the subsidy you give on these drugs, people take them more often. I like to say, depending on a baseline adherence rate of 50 to 60 percent, you'll get anywhere between 5 and 15 percent increase in adherence with a VBID program. But there are many other reasons why people don't take their meds, and the better you tie them to the other programs, some of which Mark alluded to, the better you're going to get results in the end. The interesting sideline of this evidence review is that as the national trend has been to make people pay more for everything, the VBID programs that actually lowered consumer out-of-pocket costs for these selected services were very uh, well-received from more of a public relations and communication standpoint. We have collected now hundreds of testimonials of people who say that they're managing their depression, their diabetes, their cancer, uh, their other common conditions so much easier and more effectively now because they don't have financial burdens placed in front of them. And uh, while I would love to get in front of you and tell you that these VBID carrot programs for high value prescription drug classes are going to quote bend the trend, uh, what I can tell you is we get better health uh, at no incremental spend and I like to describe that as first class for the price of coach. And uh, there are very, very few things in healthcare that actually make people healthier and lower costs. The fact that we are consistently and systematically making cohorts of patients healthier at no incremental cost is uh, very rare in healthcare. Uh, health IT doesn't do it. Medical homes don't do it. Disease management doesn't do it. So I'm not going to say we're the answer to the trend problem. But uh, we make people healthier and, and improve uh, many companies' stock prices uh, compared to the status quo. And as I alluded to, no surprisingly, it should um, come somewhat straightforwardly to each of you that the people who benefit most from the VBID cost reductions are those people who tend to be socioeconomically challenged and those with common chronic diseases that even if they're faced with, say, 4 or $6 generic drug costs, if you have diabetes, hypertension, and another chronic disease, you're sometimes filling 8, 10, 12 prescriptions a month. And uh, we have been very pleased to report uh, that the major benefit of EBIT programs has been coming into those who either clinically or economically need it most. Uh, here is an interesting example of one of the larger um, and better designed trials of value-based insurance design uh, done with Aetna and some folks at CVS um, looking at taking a cohort of population in a commercially insured group. This was Aetna, who had a history of heart attacks. They took half of their plan sponsors and kept them in their standardized plan that had great disease management, great nurse phone lines, great mail order. And what they did was uh, took medications branded and generic for their post-heart attack care and made them free for half of the plan sponsors in, in the standard care and the others. And uh, this enhanced prescription covered coverage, improve medication adherence, and more importantly, uh, reduce the vascular vent rate and decreased patient spending, which is that out-of-pocket part, without increasing overall healthcare costs. So here we thought in a particular patient population, we did a really nice job illustrating that you could find these folks, you know the meds they need to take, you're going to make them less expensive. In this case, they went all the way to free, which is not at all a requirement of mine and gave some very favorable results. Moreover, that when we looked at people who needed their medications most from a common chronic disease or socioeconomic challenge standpoint, uh, we actually found that in the individuals who identified themselves as being not white, not only were these healthcare benefits that we found in the general population to be duplicated, we found that there was actually a dramatic 70% reduction in healthcare spend. So while this study was not directed initially for those we knew who were socioeconomically challenged, we actually found in a subgroup analysis that what we'd expect, those people who seem to be most uh, likely to benefit from cost reductions act, in fact, did not only clinically, but also uh, financially. So well, quick, quick point here. Yeah, um, when, you when you reference the word free, I kind of, I react to that and I know our members will too, because we both know it's not free. Um, it's prepaid, and therefore it's in the premiums because anything you're taking away from out-of-pocket cost share to the member ultimately will result in greater coverage, and resulting in greater coverage means higher insurance costs. Right. So, so you it's, it's a subtle nuance, but I just want to make the point that it's not free. 
So, Mark, I, I heard you. We had a conversation about this personally. I beg to differ in this situation. And I listened to you. In this case, if you go back two slides, which I'll show you, because the, um, because the free drugs did not lead to any increase in added expenditure, I beg to differ with you. There was no increase in premium. And, in fact, in this one example, I was very carefully uh, to use the word free because, because the offsets were complete in this population, and, in fact, there was cost savings in this population, you would even agree with me that these free drugs for this population actually turned out to be a net benefit to everyone. So I hear you loud and clear. I don't use the word free unless I really believe it to be an aggregate term. And I believe in this situation where reducing the cost of the consumer of the drugs to zero not only did not increase further costs down the road. In certain populations, it actually lowered total costs down the road. So I think you'll probably agree with me on this small, very nuanced example. Yes, and that effect, I would agree with you, is lower cost. I was making the point that there is a cost, but it's offset by the lowering cost because of the adherence of medication. So I right. accept that argument. In almost every other situation, which I agree, such as uh, will come up later in the ACA, that, yeah, when you lower costs to of, of many high value services and the offsets don't cover uh, the incremental use, then of course it will lead to increased utilization, often um, higher premiums, often higher prices and a spiral that I believe we're completely aligned with that we want to nip in the bud. Yeah. So, so the fascinating part, I believe many of the NEHU members have heard about value-based insurance design and heard about it in the uh, area of prescription drugs which is uh, probably the easiest to implement, uh, the best studied. I think that uh, we have very strong track record. Uh, this slide uh, is just intended to let uh, the members know and listeners know that value-based insurance design has extended in the past decade far beyond prescription drugs uh, to prevention and screening, which I'll talk about, the diagnostic tests and monitoring like hemoglobin A1C levels for diabetics and cholesterol levels for people with heart disease, specific treatments uh, like certain types of knee replacements, clinician visits to get your blood pressure checked, uh, high-performing networks, medical homes and hospitals. And I believe a, a significant majority of the listeners have been aware of probably the best example of value-based insurance design in a choice of venue where Lowe's, the second largest home improvement com company in this country, uh, made a decision to send voluntarily any of their associates anywhere in the country uh, to the Cleveland Clinic uh, for invasive heart procedures, and in that decision, actually reduced out-of-pocket costs for that associate and a family member lower than their local hospital. And uh, being from Michigan with a rivalry of Ohio, uh, we call Cleveland negative medical tourism, but uh, given the success of the Cavaliers, I'm happy to see Cleveland move forward. But I, I really do want to let the listeners know that while VBID for drugs may be something that's somewhat acceptable among the folks you're working with, the idea that many of the stakeholders you're working with are thinking about using benefit design to steer individuals for certain providers, or in this case, certain health systems for certain procedures, falls perfectly aligned uh, with the concept of clinical nuance, and it seems to be growing and growing and, and growing. Mark, domestic so, medical tourism is something that's being talked about with a lot of our, I'll speak personally, a lot of our clients, and domestic medical tourism could be as much as bringing Springfield, which is on the western part of Massachusetts, to Boston. It doesn't necessarily need to be in Cleveland, but at the end of the day, I think you're right. There is an emerging trend of making sure people go get the right care for, for significant or, or, or situations that should be given a, a greater level of care to a place where there are experts in them and do them often. So I, I think there's a lot of a lot of movement in that direction. Right. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, that as you look at this slide, looking at the really interesting uh, breadth of stakeholders that have supported a value-based insurance design, from the country's largest union to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the National Governors Association uh, to a whole bunch of uh, think tanks from the broad range of ideology. The next time I make this slide, I hope I'll have put any HU. Uh, on the folks who are supporting this initiative, but I just wanted to let folks know that as we've been percolating this for over a decade, uh, we've been able to get a whole lot of 
stakeholders of very ideologies on board uh, with the idea. So with that, I think Mark and I will kind of take you through um, a couple specific examples and we'll spend uh, the most time on the last one uh, moving forward about how the value-based insurance design idea concept uh, that we came up with here in Michigan uh, in the late last century and kind of seemed it move forward, largely driven uh, by the private sector, large self-insured companies uh, were the key components of moving the idea forward, understanding fiscal responsibility with clinical sensitivity, understanding uh, the idea of clinical nuance and working uh, with their vendors and their partners to understand that they should probably spend more money in certain places and less money in others, and it's really started to get on the uh, right track. We are uh, very fortunate to have um, a very small imprint on one page of a 900-page law that most people refer to as Obamacare. One of the most popular aspects of the ACA is the reduction and elimination of cost sharing on very selected evidence-based primary preventive services. So Mark and my uh, colonoscopy will never co cost us uh, a nickel, although I would agree with Mark that, that reducing our cost sharing for colonoscopy will, in fact, slightly increase our premiums down the road. Uh, Janet's mammograms and pap smears will be uh, forever at a zero cost sharing for her. This is a remarkably popular aspect of the ACA across party lines, and I'm very happy, uh, and I apologize to Michael King on this, that I did not update this slide. Uh, HHS put out a report two weeks ago that says now 137 million have received expanded coverage of preventive services on the basis of Section 2713. Now, uh, someone who advocated for clinically nuanced coverage of prevention going as far back as 2007 on Capitol Hill, I want members to know that I did not argue for the creation of formal lists. I did not argue to set the cost sharing to zero. What I argued to them is what I argue to you today, is that if, if a national organization says that the evidence is strong for life-saving for a particular cancer screening, such as pap smears or colonoscopies, I have felt very strongly that for the specified patient groups, uh, the cost sharing for those who are likely to benefit should be lower than other cancer tests that are not as well proven or in other populations for which there's no evidence. So again, you know, sometimes I like to say, quote, the wisdom of Congress, end quote, um, sometimes takes ideas a little bit further uh, than the initial advocate meant it to be. So we were very fortunate uh, when the federal government took the VBIT idea out of Section 2713 of the ACA and actually put down a definition in terms of formal regulations. I think that you would all agree that the breadth of this definition to include providers, treatments, and services uh, does not pigeonhole creative folks like you on the phone to think about where they might implement value-based insurance design in either new or future products that might be available to public and private payers. Very briefly on uh, Medicare, it's um, really good timing this week in the fact that because of concerns in 1965 over discrimination when the Medicare law was signed, it is almost impossible to put clinical nuance in place in either traditional Medicare or in Medicare Advantage. But as, again, multiple stakeholders understand that maybe a diabetic should have a different copay for an eye exam than a non-diabetic, and many of these other clinically nuanced examples, uh, we have been advocating in a bipartisan way to uh, allow a demonstration for value-based insurance design uh, to be just explored and implemented in Medicare. Um, I will tell you that if I just last week, just I didn't have time to update these slides, uh, the VBID for Better Care Act of 2015 uh, was reintroduced in both the House and the Senate with bipartisan political support. And I think most of you know how hard it is to get bipartisan political support on anything related to health care. Uh, all information about these new bills uh, available on the vbidcenter.org website. This work on Capitol Hill to allow us to try more flexible, more nuanced plans and MA is accompanied by a simultaneous movement in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI. Uh, they have asked uh, you and the American public for their opinion on the role of BBIT and Medicare Advantage in November of 2014, and we are very hopeful that a formal RFP uh, will be released in the second and third quarter of this year 
uh, to allow uh, private and public plans to try value-based insurance design with a required evaluation component to actually see if we could achieve uh, those goals that Mark alluded to earlier. So I'm gonna, get, gonna jump quickly so we can get to HSA soon, but um, all of you know, we'll probably have almost all the states represented on this call. Most would agree that the laboratories and state healthcare transformation is not federal, but is coming from the states. And we are, um, working to get value-based insurance design in a number of various places. Uh, there are now 11 states that have incorporated value-based insurance design into their state employee benefit plans. I'm hopeful that um, our friends from South Carolina, Virginia, New York, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, you know, many of these states that are thinking about or have implemented VBIN in their state employee plans uh, will be happy to share their stories moving forward. Uh, Value-based insurance design has been included specifically and explicitly in certain exchange legislation uh, in establishing those exchanges. I'm sure you probably have a webinar coming up soon, Janet, on what might be happening with uh, when the Supreme Court rules on King versus Burwell. I'll leave that to another day. The consumer-owned and operated plans running in several states have implemented VBID components into their plans, and we were very pleased to see that uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services uh, publishing a rule in 2003 allowing uh, Medicaid plans to implement aspects of clinical nuance in their programs moving forward. And I was very happy to see that value-based insurance design was prominently featured in the Medicaid expansion here in Michigan, which was one of the few states with a Republican governor and a Republican House and Senate uh, that decided uh, to expand Medicaid, but very much put elements of consumerism in the program, including cost sharing, transparency, personal accountability, uh, with the protections of clinical nuance and value-based insurance design to allow specific elements of cost sharing reductions uh, for those services that are deemed to be high value for selected populations. So, Mark, you would you believe, agree that Medicaid could implement moderate consumer engagement tools in its design, although probably not a, you know, you know, a rapid move or a wholesale move in this direction, things like tiered copay, saving cards, and other incentives could encourage appropriate utilization of preventive care, maybe compliance with disease management programs, and keeping scheduled appointments to begin to engage these types of patients, even at the Medicaid level. We, you know, we absolutely agree, and I, was, I, I thought I said, said to you six times I, that I would say it over the, you know, 75 minutes or so. I have gone to several states that have been exploring this, uh, previously Pennsylvania before their gubernatorial change, Indiana, Michigan, you know, Tennessee. Uh, I am a very, and Virginia, very strong proponent of high consumer cost sharing with the important caveat, Mark, that I'm, again, trying to say this clearly, I want the high levels of consumer cost sharing to be implemented in a clinically nuanced way. I do not want consumer cost sharing on insulin or drugs for epilepsy or for drugs for HIV. I want them to be on the services deemed by the professional societies deemed to be of low value. And I think this is a very appropriate point before I delve into the final topic of HSAs, that one of the really interesting aspects driven by true leaders in this field understand the idea of, of increasing the use of high value services. We are very pleased to have a ongoing national conversation about the 30% estimated waste out of every dollar spent in healthcare on either low or no value services without evidence, administrative waste or duplicity. And we've been very fortunate to work with business coalitions from across the country who have basically said, Mark, we completely get your idea of lowering cost sharing on the high value stuff. What about helping us identify and increase cost sharing on the low value stuff? And if um, NAHU has not already addressed uh, this fabulous initiative called Choosing Wisely, which is under the auspices of Consumers Union and the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, which has brought together now a large number of professional medical societies who have each given a list of five services that they feel uh, may be overused or may be of uh, not producing high clinical value uh, to consumers and patients. And now that we have the umbrella of a national dialogue of not only too little of the good stuff, but maybe too much of the bad stuff, 
um, my colleague Michael Chernu and, and David Edmond have created, with the help of Milliman Med Insight Group, a a software program called the Health Waste Calculator. And the Health Waste Calculator allows uh, small and lar large firms to just simply identify uh, what they're spending their money on for things that have been identified by professional organizations as low or no value and who's providing that. So it's allowed a very nice discussion, pretty much driven by the small business community to say, Mark, we get the high value stuff. You also have to help us on the low value stuff where we really could push uh, that consumer engagement initiative that uh, you know, Mark, or we agree on. Excellent. So with that, the home stretch now is uh, you set the table 55 minutes ago, and I, I want to talk about which is an issue that's near and dear to uh, both of our hearts, which is uh, this really unique and innovative instrument created in the early 2000s called Health Savings Accounts Qualified High Level Health Plan. And as uh, you guys know much better than I do uh, on the phone, is that we have seen a rapid, rapid growth of high deductible health plans and consumer directed health plans in general, and specifically around the health savings accounts qualified HDHPs. And I think all of you know that no matter who you read, academic, uh, firms like Ann Hewitt or Towers, Watson or Milliman, that if anything, we're going to see an expanded enrollment of HDHPs in general and HSA HDHPs specifically as we move forward. So as Mark alluded to, and I believe that the totality of the evidence would agree that the higher out-of-pocket costs that come with these plans in a non-nuanced way uh, hinder the use of evidence-based services. And we could argue about the amount, but I think it's pretty hard now, particularly after the three reports that came out in the last week, to say that people are not spending their money wisely on health care. What issues come to rise for us that who care about people who are most at risk, those with chronic diseases and socioeconomic challenges, these are the people who are most likely to go without care due to cost or experience financial hardship or toxicity due to medical bills. So I don't, I want to set this up. I love the instrument and I'm going to say it for the fifth time. I love the idea of high deductibles. I just don't like the idea of high deductibles for the things I beg my patients to do. So when Mark and I met and I've been doing this for a very long time, when, when I talk about this to employers and public payers around the country and we look for a finger to point at, people want to say, oh, it's the health plans. Oh, it's the pharma companies. Oh, it's the politicians. It turns out that the finger could be pointed squarely in this issue of HSA qualified HDHPs, the Internal Revenue Service. And the Internal Revenue Service, and we have this documented on some really great resources available on our website, that in that early 2000s, and I actually know the people who drafted this regulation, they specifically excluded services meant to treat an existing illness, injury, or condition uh, from that safe harbor deductible exempt status. So those mammographies, flu shots, pap smears, smoking cessation counseling that I mentioned under the ACA, you guys all know that whether we like it or not, those must be covered pre-deductible and even better or worse, they must be covered at a zero cost sharing pre-deductible, which is, as I said earlier, is not something I argued for. So the rub is, is that as we start moving uh, from volume-based payment to value-based payment and have these quality metrics for which clinicians like myself, medical homes, health systems, accountable care organizations are being really incented to do more of, many of these well-established quality metrics require the entire deductible to be met before coverage begins. And I tell the story of a patient of mine who I saw on January 2nd who was in an HSA HDHP who had one deductible exempt visit to see me. And she told me that her medicine to treat her blood sugar, her high blood pressure, and her high cholesterol were not covered pre-deductible. Her eye exam was not covered pre-deductible. Her blood test to check her blood sugar and her blood strips and her monitors, as well as all the other quality metrics for which I was being benchmarked on, were not deductible exempt. So here I'm thinking, these are the things that I am going to need to do to acquire my bonus in an accountable care arena. And here is the fastest growing type of health plan 
is not covering a great majority of those same metrics. And if that wasn't bad enough, after the visit, she told me that she didn't have the money to access most of these quality metrics and that if I, I'd either see her next January or see her when she was in the hospital. And I think that these type of anecdotes are very telling. And I think Mark and I completely agree that as I've talked about now since 2003 about talking to stakeholders to allow plans the flexibility, underline, not mandatory, the flexibility to expand the safe harbor to cover those services that are currently clinicians are being sent to do makes a lot of sense. And we have research to show that 90% of private employers support the idea of having plans the flexibility to expand the deductible exempt definition to include chronic disease care, which I said earlier is where the money is. So we see with NAHU and others a really nice opportunity to march on the Internal Revenue Service, allow this guidance to be changed to include chronic disease services to be covered in an HSA as deductible exempt, mindful, still cost-sharing, but not fully uh, had to be paid for by an employee, I call this new hybrid a high-value health plan. The high-value health plan maintains those key elements that Mark, Ganya, and I agree on. Consumer accountability, lower cost, price transparency. The only difference is it, change, it doesn't even change the amount of the deductible, it just changes the services that are allowed to be deductible exempt. We have been talking about this now for several years. We have studied it with great uh, scrutiny. Uh, as all of you know, that a HSA, HCHP with a VBIT element would have lower premiums than PPOs and HMOs. And that although the, the VBIT HSA hybrid would probably have a slightly higher premium than an HSA, about 4 to 5%, uh, an independent academic group at the University of Minnesota estimated that over 40 million employees would enroll in this type of plan, three-quarters of them buying down from more expensive plans as a vehicle to avoid the Cadillac tax, and about 10 million people buying up who want all the elements of an HSA, HDHP, but understand that there are certain services that they would want covered because they have predictable costs due to identified chronic disease. The great part about the high-value health plan, if it would be allowed to occur, is that by these shifts, most people buying down from these plans subject to the Cadillac tax and might be viewed as overinsured and underengaged, as Mark would say, it actually lowers aggregate health care expenditures on a population level substantially. So, um, you know, Mark, I've uh, fought very hard and very long to... Uh, get organizations like NAHU and, and, and influential folks like you for a while to get behind this uh, movement to get IRS to, to uh, alter this safe harbor, of course, not mandating, but allow plans flexibility, and would love your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think the fact that you're underscoring uh, the fact that there's flexibility, so it's not a mandatory. The problem with the current IRS regulation is it's mandatory. There is no flexibility. It is what it is. So if we can create a situation where an employer would like to add in additional protection uh, to encourage their people because of their population uh, to adopt a high value health plan as opposed to a traditional PDHP uh, fashioned with a health savings account. I, I don't think you'd find many people that would argue with that because it embraces the principle of choice and it embraces the principle of making sure that we're appropriately managing the health of the people that we're trying to talk to. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality with this thought process. Well, that's um, that's very kind. So, for those of you in, in Central and Mountain Time, I'm I'm showing a piece. This is my last slide. I just want to say um, one additional thing before we leave the HSA issue. So, um, Janet's team knows about uh, what we've been doing. I'm going to send immediately to her team a new infographic uh, that we just published last week on the high value health plan, and to see uh, have you guys take a look at it. Uh, comment on it, disseminate it. And because of this real strange bedfellow, broad coalition around clinical nuance in both Medicare and HSA high-value health plans, 
I've been extremely encouraged by a large multi-stakeholder coalition who said, Mark, you've got to just not talk about this. You need to make it happen. So uh, two months ago, we launched the Coalition for Smarter Healthcare, smarterhc.org. I'll send this out in the materials afterwards, which brings together health sciences companies, consumer advocates, health plans, clinician groups, hospital systems, who basically take upon themselves uh, a version of what Mark Gagne just said, is that give us flexibility to try some innovative new ideas to allow us to get more health for the money that we're spending, since we all realize there's more than enough money uh, in the system. And I close with this part because I think all of you know that the money, the resources, the attention, and the sophistication in healthcare transformation in my opinion, is being driven around the supply side, how to pay physicians like myself, how to pay medical homes, how to pay doctors, the SGR repeal, alternative payment models, ACOs, medical homes, MOUSE. In my explanation to people who are much less sophisticated than you folks, I call supply side initiatives peanut butter. I will tell you that as we are finally leaving the talk to talk stage to get to walk to walk, around volume to value, I am incredibly discouraged that the current major demand side initiatives are actually driving patients away from clinical nuance and value. And I say this quite simply in the fact that how is it that now I'm being paid a handsome bonus to get my patients with diabetes to the eye doctor to have their annual eye check and that the fastest growing type of health plan in this country provides zero coverage for a diabetic eye exam before a 2,000, 5,000, sometimes 12,000 family deductible is met. And then once we're able to create that hybrid of high deductibles just for the things that we shouldn't be buying, and then we can incorporate clinical nuance into both payment reform and benefit design, I truly believe uh, that quality of care, which drives me as a clinician, uh, the employee experience, which drives many of you and the people you work with, and containing cost growth, which is not only an individual but a national problem, uh, can be attained. I really do believe that without clinical nuance and this continued ability to rely on, on one-size-fits-all or very blunt instruments to try to get people to change behavior by driving prices down on everything and make people pay more for everything, uh, will be a much less efficient alternative to get to that triple aim. So with that, um, you see this slide about how underwriters uh, can play an important role in this transition from volume to value. I mentioned a smarterhc.org. And uh, with that and 22 minutes to spare, I will turn it over to you, Mark, and hopefully we'll get some uh, good questions and maybe some criticisms from uh, your colleagues on the listening side. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate uh, that. On behalf of the association, we appreciate your uh, perspectives on this very important subject. I think there, um, I have a number of questions that have already come in uh, from our audience, but I'm going to start out with one uh, that, that I wanted to ask you uh, relative to the role you believe transparency of healthcare costs and quality plays and the second part of that question is healthcare literacy. And what I mean by that is we have people that are now being exposed through high deductibles to the actual cost of care, which heretofore, uh, before the advent of HD, HDHPs, people really were shielded from that through the use of a copay. And not to suggest that they shouldn't get care, but they should be certainly aware of the fact that their doctor office isn't, isn't quite off. It's $200 or $300 or $150, depending on where you're going to seek care and what market. And we both know what works in one state and the fact in one state is different than another. But I'm curious for your views on the role of healthcare cost and quality transparency and the role of healthcare literacy to help people feel more confident, regardless of what socioeconomic status they have, but to feel more confident about being an engaged, empowered consumer in the healthcare environment. Right. So, so that's a, a really great question with a lot of different elements there. So I use the term healthcare literacy differently than my colleague down the hall, who basically just talks about how many of our consumers don't even know what some of the instructions actually mean. So 
So a couple points on this. So, so the Center for Value-Based Insurance Design has worked very closely with the major uh, transparency organizations, Catalyst for Payment Reform, HCI3, and others. And we actually have a really neat white paper for those who want to dive into that issue uh, about the synergies between transparency and clinical nuance. It's available on the website that you see here on the slide, bbitcenter.org. So you can imagine, uh, you know, we're aligned on 98% of things. I am a huge fan of both transparency and your definition of literacy. I, I think that until we start letting people understand what the real costs of the services are, we're not going to make a lot of headway, although you would predict correctly, Mark, like my mother, that what patients really care about is the, the cost that they're paying out of their own pocket. So we have that extreme of that happens when you're under the deductible. It doesn't happen when you're not. And uh, ultimately, we need some middle-of-the-ground solutions. So, you know, I don't want people worried about the money, uh, you know, to take their blood thinner when they have a blood clot in their leg. But I do want people to not only think twice or thrice about that MRI for back pain, because even if you know the price of the MRI, doesn't mean that you need it. And the crux of our white paper that I just alluded to is just because we're going to be able to say information on cost and hopefully quality doesn't get around this issue of clinical nuance. So if you're a, you know, a 60 year old uh, needs to get colorectal cancer screening, then it should be incumbent upon you, even if your cost sharing is zero uh, to go to the ambulatory center as opposed to inpatient center, because it's going to ultimately cost uh, your employer public or private substantially less for the same outcome. And I think that is a major part of, of the VBID movement. I think ultimately to just say, oh, here's the lowest cost to get a knee replacement. And I think you'd agree with me that, you know, a lot of people who get knee replacements don't need a knee replacement and instead should go to physical therapy, then um, that would be fine. I think that if it's not going to be required reading for me, but I saw some of the future webinars, uh, the, the great Atul Gawande uh, writing in this month's New Yorker magazine has an article called Overkill. And uh, while, you know, he talks about in a very artistic, wonderful way about the problem of the fee-for-service system in and uh, maybe over-generous uh, health care benefits, Mark, as you allude to, that people are not at all responsible in making wise health care choices. I would probably say, having studied this for two decades, it's more of a peanut butter problem than a jelly problem. In other words, we have to change how we pay our clinicians. But there is this issue that I'm sure this organization can get behind that more isn't always better. And as Dr. Gawande makes clear in his article, it's not just about getting rid of the waste, but also investing more in those high value services that we're not using enough of. Yeah, and I think we I think we would all agree with that, Mark. I think the challenge is, you know, if you just look at variation of cost, just as one example, and I'll pick up on your MRI and go along with that. I mean, here, in, here where I live, I could have an MRI by Shield that costs $500 or so the exact same test administered by a person with the exact same level of education costs $3,000 with no discernible difference in quality. That's not okay. Agreed. So I'm making a statement, but I'm, I'm making a statement in the context of transparency because that just drives consumers crazy. Wait a minute. If they're two of the same machines administered by a person with the same level of education, but there's a 600% variation in cost. Why? Because the, because the member can't speak what it is until after they've had the service. So we'll set that aside for a moment. I'm going to come to a question on clinical nuance. The question is, how does clinical nuance apply to the current discussion in the media and pharma industry about paying more for drugs that work better than others for the same condition? Shouldn't we pay more for the drugs that don't work as well? So shouldn't patients pay more for drugs that don't work as well? Yes. So so this is a so that um, again the, the questioner is completely aligned on this idea that you know ultimately for me uh, end stage VBID 10.0 pharmacy benefit package um, looks at course at acquisition price looks at evidence of benefit and basically starts finding those things that produce the most value. Right, regardless of the price, because the price is only one part of it, in the lowest tier. I am very happy to tell you that there are a number of these experiments going on. There is uh, something called a value-based formulary put in place by Primera, a health plan in, in Washington State, 
Uh, they reported their results in the April issue of the American uh, um, the American Journal of Managed Care Pharmacy and Specialty Medications, uh, you know, showing exactly what you'd hope by putting low cost sharing on the drugs that work best, higher cost sharing on the drugs that don't work best, considering both cost and quality in that equation actually leads to the redistribution of resources that, Mark, you were pushing for for the first five minutes. So, yep. you know, there are a lot of examples where people want drugs that are no better and more expensive. I believe that they should pay more. There's also the example of people being asked to take drugs that we know that are not as good and they have to pay much less. Um, I'll quickly allude to this idea that we're working on now with lots of payers around the country called Reward the Good Soldier or Dynamic Benefit Design, which takes uh, in place this idea of precision medicine that you know, diseases that Americans are confronted with actually change over time. So as a primary care doctor in a managed care plan, I am a religious user of generic drugs first line. What I'm being seeing more and more, particularly as people are put in high deductible plans with no pharmacy benefit, that when they expend their generic options, they take nothing. And that in the reward, the good soldier idea is if you take generic drugs and they don't work, or you take generic drugs and you need an additional branded drug, your cost sharing for the drug that is now viewed as high value is lowered, but not low. So by doing the things that you would believe, given your introductory comments, are responsible and accountable, you not only get penalized, which is frequently the case, you actually get rewarded for doing what you were supposed to do. Excellent. That sounds, that sounds promising. Um, I like the name dynamic, too. That's uh, the dynamic benefit design, you said, yeah? Help um, me trick. Help me trademark it, Mark. <laughs> Pretty simple filing process. I'm sure you know how to do that. Um, one question here about employers. You know, many of our members, most of our members, are servicing uh, clients in the small group market, which until 2016 or until there's different regulation, under 50 is considered the small group marketplace. In that marketplace, right. you probably know, uh, it's community rated and, and there's no experience for employers to look at, no claims information for employers to look at unless they go to a higher deductible health plan, at least they can see uh, what's underneath the deductible and so they exhaust the deductible, then that information becomes invisible again. But how does an employer, uh, from your perspective, know how well it's spending its health care dollars? That's a question that came in from one of our members. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think that ultimately, I, I have to tell you, not only in the small business market, in the large business market, I find it amazing to me that... Um, you know, a firm that's spending a billion dollars a year on health care knows more about the paper clips they buy than the health care they buy. And yeah. I think a lot of this is being unfolded uh, through the transparency movement, thankfully, and the discussion of moving from volume to value. Um, you know, I, I work with lots of organizations, large and small, to help them look under the hood a little bit. What I typically uh, recommend is you you can look at those um, you can look at those services for which a typical pay for performance program or reward pro program would be based and see how well you're doing on the positive side. And if you're not doing very well, think about levers that you might pull, including lower cost sharing to get those numbers up. But also, which is very attractive in the employer community, is, is having a legitimate conversation about uh, the, the waste, or as Dr. Gwande calls, the overkill going on and uh, using some tools to see that maybe you're spending your money in the wrong places, whether it be services that not should be used at all, or Mark, and you allude to that maybe we could get more outpatient colonoscopies and more MRIs down the road than in the one that's advertised for having the sparkling artesian water and uh, the you know the the Bose headphones. Well, Mark, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about, and uh, a subject I'm sure you hear a lot about, at least through the debate of healthcare reform. Uh, is the whole notion of uh, making sure that people are making informed choices. Um, and so one of the things that, that our members talked about was transparency in hospital billing is next to impossible with the current model of uncompensated care being promoted by disproportionate hospital share payments being paid by the federal government. So the question is, how are we going to address a system that rewards hospitals to, uh, to claim that they're non-profit, claim to be non-profit with huge losses? 
Yeah, so you know, so like we always get to the point around 220 where that, that question, I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at it, but obviously by even by reading it, you know, Mark, that's a bit out of my wheelhouse. So I'm going to sidestep that for a second and maybe get back to it and say, one, uh, to the intro to the question, shared decision-making, which is a major part of this personal accountability transparency movement is a critical aspect of things moving forward. So in the areas that there might be overuse, such as uh, prostate cancer screening, uh, back surgery, a joint replacement, it's been amazing now with the foundation for shared decision-making doing studies for decades to show that when people are actually fully informed of the potential health gains and the risks that come with interventions, they frequently tend to be much more conservative uh, than their initial treatment choice. So that will certainly help and should be implemented in all of these VBID consumer-directed type of movements. A second point that you raise is I'm sidestepping the payment uh, for not-for-profit status is uh, the area over billing. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's coming to fore through the lay media about how unbelievably, uh, for lack of a better term, egregious and, and uninformative the whole billing process is. And that, you know, maybe it's upon your organization to help, uh, you know, bring some rationality uh, to that process. But uh, exactly what I predicted, as I told you on the phone, that is larger uh, consumer groups are being exposed to a higher amount of out-of-pocket exposure. Uh, there has been a fair bit of growth in the startup world of, of, of collection agencies and the fact that a bill that if you're overinsured didn't really mean anything, you never looked at it, uh, now if you're underinsured, uh, the bill really means a lot. And I've seen stories in Forbes and Wired and all these other things basically going out and telling your consumers in these consumer-directed plans how to go out and negotiate and ultimately uh, lower their out-of-pocket exposure to a common medical condition. And I think one of the things we haven't talked about but certainly has a place in the discussion is the whole notion of if we have a 30% waste, uh, in spend, and the defensive practice of medicine has a place has a part to play in this entire discussion. So, what are your thoughts on how we deal with that? Yeah, of course, uh, no conversation about clinical nuance could go without a discussion about malpractice and litigation. So, we have studied this for a very long time. We've talked about a number of policymakers in a large number of states. All I can say is, while it frequently comes up as an issue that needs to be addressed, I think. Almost everyone who's kind of studied this without a dog in the fight would say that if you remove financial incentives for physicians to do more, a lot of this, what's described as CYA or extra stuff, tends to go away. And uh, we, we published a research paper looking at behaviors, say, of, of certain medical services that are deemed to be performed for defensive medical reasons. And mm -hmm. we have found that in states where physicians are really well covered and have no exposure and, and those who have a lot more exposure that fee-for-service doctors order them the exact same amount of time. So uh, I think we're in a very, very exciting time for, for your organization as well as us in general that with the repeal of sustainable growth rate and some legitimacy driven by the private sector around changing how we're going to pay for healthcare services on the peanut butter side. I really, really think that those of us who work on the consumer jelly side, benefit design side, will be able to benefit. As I wind down here, Mark, I'll tell you one of my favorite quotes come from Upton Sinclair's great book about the Chicago stockyards called The Jungle. He said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. And uh, if we really, even if we take the slow walk to that 50% goal of having value-based payments as opposed to fee-for-service payments by the end of this decade, I really do think if that walk is going to begin, uh, the opportunities for you and your organization to be innovative and capitalize on a movement away from volume to one that's more clinically nuanced uh, really could be an excellent opportunity to make the triple aim come true. And Mark, with, with that, I have one more question, and I'll have obviously a, a couple of closing remarks. Once the question comes in from a member, uh, is the healthcare economy, including physicians, hospitals, and big pharma, ready for lower incomes that will result from more efficient and effective use of services? So 
that's a great closing question. I'll answer. So the, the, the great part about that is no one's incomes are going to go down. So remember, if we're talking about $3.7 trillion, we're talking about bending the trend, we're still adding hundreds of billions of dollars in health care spend every year. And um, no one's talking about actually cutting health care costs. We're always just talking about let's get the rate of health care growth around uh, the CPI or whatever you guys look at. So I, I, I've been to a large number of these stakeholders, and I appreciate your member asking this question, is that I tell folks that I will guarantee that their incomes will t- continue to go up. But what they need to just buy into the fact that the services that they're going to be providing will be based on how much healthier we make individuals and populations as opposed to how profitable in terms of a relative value unit they used to be. And I'm just thinking about the the organizations that your members work with, the idea of buying health as opposed to buying services that were deemed to be profitable regardless of how much healthier the individual or population was made, I am so pleased to think that that dogma is on its way out and one that's going to base our conversation not on how much we spend but how well we spend it is really ultimately going to be uh, you know, a really good outcome for, for everybody. And I think you're talking to an audience that shares that belief with you. So with a few minutes we have left, uh, I'll just – close by saying first thank you mark uh, on behalf of the uh, education foundation for your uh, your wisdom your insight and for advocating really to try and help us be more efficient and effective about the way we we purchase health care and finance health care frankly um, we are very passionate about the principles of transparency responsibility and opportunity and believe they're the foundation of a robust free market health care system that embraces consumers and their notion of personal responsibility and accountability in making informed choices to live a healthy lifestyle. We believe that by educating or engaging rather educating and empowering consumers, we can all help people build their health care confidence to improve their health and lower costs. I think many on the phone would agree with me. Uh, the notion that someone who makes 8 or $10 an hour can't make an informed choice is, is, is an old thought process. Uh, Four billion people of the seven billion people on this planet have a cell phone device in their pocket. Even in countries that are considered third world and don't have uh, an infrastructure of a telephone line, so to speak, they have had cell phone technology actually uh, probably before we did here in the United States. So the notion of being able to, to help people at all socioeconomic levels, I believe, is something that we, we, we very passionately believe. We also know that CHDs, and in particular HDHDs and HSAs, are governed by IRS regulation and through your great work, we now have a, a decade of experience that tells the story about how we can evolve by the notion of a CDHB into a high-value health plan. So the concept of redefining preventive care uh, to encourage treatment adherence and to improve uh, the health and well-being of the consumer, from our point of view, just makes good common sense. Um, high-value health plans, in our view, after listening to you and really understanding your perspective, may just be the evolution that CDH uh, class HSA needs. So on behalf of the membership, appreciate the hard work you're doing, and I look forward to uh, to seeing more of it as we move forward in time. Great. Thank you, Mark. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm just a little disappointed the amount of members that have followed me on Twitter since we started. So I'm going to push one more time for at UM underscore VBID and look forward to continuing this dialogue moving forward. It's been a great opportunity to get in front of you. I hope uh, many of you will engage in this process, either through the VBIT Center or the Coalition for Smarter Healthcare to bring about HVHPs. But I'll send some additional information and hopefully Mark will share with the uh, attendees and we'll continue the dialogue. We absolutely will. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody, for dialing in. We appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this webinar series and certainly look forward to you uh, attending our next webinar series on um, June 29th at convention this year at 8 a.m. We'll have a discussion on benefit design and payment reform, which will be at the National Convention. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much to today's speakers. We also thank each of you for participating in today's program. This concludes Webinar 4, Value-Based Insurance Design, with Mark Fendrick and Mark Gagne, presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation. Thank you again for attending. Have a great day, and you may now disconnect.